Okay, everybody, we're going to start today on lecture 14. So, quieten down now, please. I'm not going to start while you're st still talking. Okay. In general, I have a comment to make, which is people are getting a bit talkative. Um, and I know that the quarter is progressing and you're very excited about a number of things, but please do save your conversation for outside lecture hall because there are people around you that do want to learn and it's really difficult to pay attention if you're talking in front of them. Okay, so we're going to talk today, we're going to finish off the atmosphere and move on to the hydrosphere. And the hydrosphere is very relevant for us here in California, not so much because it rains on us a lot, but because it doesn't, and we still need a lot of water. So we're going to talk a lot about where we get our water um, and what might happen potentially and some of the hazards associated with, with water. Um, so the reading for today, um, this is the, the water section, the freshwater section at the base, and it tells you what you can have a look over and what you can skip. And the TAs are going to have the midterms, so after lecture today, if you go out the back, there's going to be one person with the white um, exams, one person with the yellow exams, and one person with the blue exams. Um, and if you form an orderly line, um, they will give you back uh, your paper, okay? And I would really very much encourage you to get your paper back, because I would like you to do a little, what we call a metacognition exercise. And it's basically thinking about how you think. So no matter how well you did in the exam, this is a healthy thing to do. It's to think about how you went about studying for the exam, how you did on the exam, and how they pair up, and what you might therefore do differently. It's sort of basically the idea is not to repeat the same old patterns. If you didn't do well, then let's find new ways or perhaps identify places where you're spending time where you don't need to, where you perhaps more valuably spend time elsewhere. So your task is to work out, well, first of all, how much time did you spend? Is that a reasonable time? Um, could you spend more? And um, what percentage of that time was doing things like reading the textbook or watching lectures for the first time? So how much did you miss the first time round? How much of that time was spent rereading or re-watching lectures again? How much of that time was actually doing something more active? So taking notes, drawing labeled diagrams, explaining things to each other. And how much time was actually spent practicing problems? And just because I don't give you them doesn't mean that you can't challenge yourselves to write multiple choice questions. If you have friends in the class, challenge each other, set yourself a lecture each and see if you can come up with three good multiple choice questions. It's actually a really good exercise to get you thinking about the material. Okay? And then after you get your exam back, look through and look where you lost points. Was it because you didn't know something? Was it because you didn't understand a term or you didn't know a piece of information? Was it because you didn't know how to apply that information? Was it not being able to understand, rearrange a formula? Or was it something more like just an error in the heat of the moment? Was it some, some mathematical error or um, circling the wrong thing, which I know people do sometimes, OK? And then think about how those match up. And think about perhaps where your time might be better spent, OK? So hopefully that will be a useful exercise. It's something you should do after every exam, really, and review what you've done. Does anyone have questions about this? OK. So, this is where we got to, and this is a perfect example of something where if you try and memorize this, you're going to go crazy, okay? It's something that if you can sit with the notes in front of you, draw it out, and write labels on it. Mine doesn't have labels just because it would make it so difficult to follow and understand. But where there's air rising at the equator, you can write yourself a label, air rising at equator because it's warmest. As air rises, it expands. And so it cools, and so we reach saturation, so we get clouds and rainfall. And that explains that nice band of clouds along the equator, our ITCZ, our intertropical convergence zone. And because we're taking air away from the surface, we're removing air from the surface, and so what's left behind is low pressure. Where we have the opposite, so at our subtropical highs, where air is being sort of forced back down to the surface, we're adding more air to the surface, and so we're going to create an area of relative high pressure. We're adding more air. And when that air sinks down, what's happening is it's compressing, and so it's heating up. 
And so we're moving away from saturation. We're becoming more and more undersaturated. And so we have lovely clear skies, just like we do in California most of the time, because that's where we're located in that nice, or just on the edge of that nice band of subtropical high pressure. Okay? And then think about the arrows. Think about what would happen if you look at the map view. Think about that winds going from high to low and that they're being deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and the left in the southern hemisphere. And if you can do that, if you can understand it, it's so much easier to learn than actually just trying to memorize where all the arrows go because that will turn into a disaster um, and it won't be fun. Okay? So have a go at it. Draw it out yourself and write little labels on it explaining to yourself what's happening. It'll help when you come back to study. So we have this amazing model, which is really simple, simple in a way, um, but it can explain so many of the really cool features that we see on the Earth, like this band of clouds and rain at the equator, where we have tropical rainforest. We have our deserts either side at 30 degrees north and south. We have our easterlies, we have our westerlies in nice symmetrical patterns about the equator. But there are certain things that we couldn't explain with this nice, simple model. And that's because our nice simple model is basically assuming that Earth's surface is all the same. It could be all water, it could be all land. In some reason, it's all the same. And so what we say is that it doesn't take land-sea contrast into account. And why is land-sea contrast important? Well, because in the northern hemisphere, we have large amounts of land. In the southern hemisphere, we have much less land, we have more ocean. And the land and the ocean respond very differently to heating. If you've ever been to the beach, you know that in the afternoon, the sand feels really hot, even though it's been exposed to the same amount of sun as the sea surface there. And so the ocean is cold. It takes much longer to warm up and cool down the ocean than it does the land. Um, and so this really messes with our nice pattern of highs and lows um, and changes some of the, the bigger scale atmospheric circulation patterns we see. And we're going to have a look at, in detail at a few of those. Um, one that's just very important for the world, which is monsoon systems. And then a couple which affect us, which is land sea breezes and also the Santa Ana winds. Okay? Um, and so before we move on, I wanted to mention if you're thinking about your concept maps, which I hope you all are, then this is a really nice example of a link. Because we have plate tectonics in the geosphere creating our land, sea, different sort of areas, and that changes through time due to plate tectonics. And so we get changes in things like atmospheric circulation. We'll talk later today about mountain ranges, and we know that mountain ranges create uplift, and so we get more rainfall. All these sorts of things are links that hopefully you should have in your head as we move forward. OK, so let's start with land, sea breezes. This is one that we experience more or less every day, often. Especially in the summer, where does the, when is it sort of most windy in the summer during the day? Is it early in the morning? Is it in the afternoon? No one's noticed? You will next year. Okay. It's so usually in the afternoon. Usually the afternoon gets really windy often around sort of two or three o'clock. And this is due to these land sea breezes. And the wind is usually coming straight off the ocean at you. Okay. Um, and so this is what happens to create that. Our land is warming up, remember, much more quickly than our ocean. So if you start the day, the temperature of the land and the ocean might be the same at the beginning of the day. But as they get exposed to incoming energy from the sun, you can see that our land has heated up a lot more than the ocean. And because the land has heated up a lot, the air immediately above the land will also be much hotter. And hot air rises. OK, so we have hot air rising above our land, and that we're taking air away from the surface again, and so we're leaving behind an area of relative low pressure compared to over the ocean. And so what happens is that air moves from the ocean at the surface, where there's relatively higher pressure, over onto land. And so land sea breezes are something that we experience, especially when it's a really hot, clear day, when we see a really big difference between the ocean and the land. Okay? And the reverse process happens at night because remember the land is therefore cooling down a lot more than the ocean. And so the warmer air now will be over the ocean. Okay? So my first eye clicker of the day. So which way will the, the wind blow during the night at the surface? 
and it's even in the diagrams, so hopefully it's a nice easy one to get us started today. So think about what's warmer at night, think about where air would be rising and creating an area of low pressure, and think about where air would move from to replace that. Few more seconds. Okay, let's take a look. So there's a 60 sort of 40 split, but I'll take the 60. Okay, it would be going from the land to the ocean. Oh, hang on. Yes, good. From the land to the ocean. Okay, so at night. Our ocean is warmer, our land has cooled down a lot quicker, and if you've ever been out in the desert in sort of November sort of time, it gets really, really, really cold. And so our warmer air is over the ocean, and so we get air blowing in from uh, the land over to the sea. Okay? So if you live at Newport Beach or anywhere along the coast, you should be able to notice this. So next time in the middle of the afternoon, you'll be able to notice the wind coming in off the sea. And at night, you'll be able to feel the air going the other way from the land. Okay, great. So, now I want to talk about monsoons. Because monsoons really operate exactly the same way as our land sea breezes. They're just on a much, much bigger scale. They're on a sort of continent-sized scale instead. Because we have this same idea. We have, where we have monsoons, we have two seasons. We have a nice, dry, hot season, and then we have a heavy precipitation season, a lot of rainfall, a lot of snowfall. And our sort of favorite place to think about the monsoon is over the sort of continent of uh, India and China around there. But we also have a smaller monsoon system in North America and elsewhere in the world. And we have the same idea. We have the fact that the land cools down much more quickly in winter and warms up much more quickly in summer. And this creates different patterns of highs and lows again, distinct from what would happen with our global atmospheric circulation. So in winter, it's really, really cold. I mean, that's sort of Siberia and Russia and really cold places. And so that air doesn't rise. It doesn't go anywhere. It stays nice and close to the surface. Whereas over the Indian Ocean, which is a pretty nice warm ocean if you've ever been there, then we, it's, it stays much warmer and so we create rising air and so we have a low pressure over the Indian Ocean and a high pressure over the, the subcontinent of Asia. And so what happens is wind goes from high to low. How much moisture do you think there might be in air right from the middle of the continent of Asia to begin with? How much water vapor do you think might be in there? Lots or a little bit? A little bit. It's over land. There isn't really much access to water sources to begin with. So it's not going to have a lot of moisture to begin with. And then look where that wind comes. It comes across the Himalayas and then down. Okay, it comes down across India. So what happens as air sinks? Does it expand or compress? So does that mean it compresses? So does that mean it cools down or warms up? Warms up. So does that mean that we become more saturated or more undersaturated? <laughs> if we're warming up, undersaturated. OK, remember our, our big sort of curving line? And we'd be moving this way. We'd be moving away from that red line. If we cool down, we'd be moving towards it. Okay. So in the winter, we have this cold, dry air coming from the center of Asia, sinking down across the Himalayas. And as it sinks, it warms up, and it gets even drier. Okay, we become even more undersaturated. And so our winter months are our really hot, dry months. Okay? And now let's think about what's happening in summer. So in summer, that land is going to heat up a lot. It responds really quickly to that incoming energy. And so we have much warmer continent, we have much warmer air above it, so that air will rise. And that rising air means that we're taking air away from the surface, we're leaving behind a low pressure 
area over the continent of Asia. And what that means now is that our relative high is over the ocean and our relative low is over Asia, and so our wind direction reverses, just like the air pressures have reversed. So our wind now goes from over the Indian Ocean, the high, towards the low over Asia. And so we have, do you think we have more moisture in the wind moving off the ocean or less? More. We've got a lot more moisture. We've got a lot more water vapor in that air above the ocean. And as it moves across India and bumps into the Himalayas, does it just stop? Where does the air go? Up goes up and over. What type of lifting was that called? Orographic lifting, absolutely. And so we have this nice moist air to begin with moving across India, and then it bumps into the Himalayas and it goes up, and so we get colder because it's expanding and we get even more precipitation and rainfall. Okay? So it's just like our land sea breezes, but on a really big scale. And so here's our monsoon systems, you can see the Australian, the Asian, the East African, the South American. And I wanted to show you the difference that these little monsoons make. Let me see if I can get this to open quickly. So this is the little map that I showed you last year. And remember, this is January right now. So look at India here. It's pretty clear of clouds. If we jump forward to maybe August, you can see how there's now enormous amounts of cloud and moisture moving up, and sort of where we see that line is where the Himalayas sort of comes to an end. Okay? So these monsoon systems are very important. And then lastly, we have Santa Ana winds. Okay. Why are Santa Ana winds feel dry? Why do Santa Ana winds feel dry? You're not going to fall for my evil question. Most people say it's because they come from the desert. Well, that's part of it. But we think of Santa Ana winds as really hot and dry events, right? And at this time of year, if you've ever been into the desert in November, especially sort of inland from us, it gets really cold. It's actually not that warm in the deserts. The deserts are much higher up, and it can be really pretty cold. But the winds that we get are still really very hot. So what's happening? Okay. So here you can see a situation where we start to get our Santa Ana winds, you know, we only get them every now and again. And it's when we have a high pressure sitting just in land of us. Okay? And because of the way wind goes from high to low and it's being deflected to the which direction in the northern hemisphere? Right. Okay? It ends up air come, ends up circulating out and blowing past us. Okay? And what happens is that as it comes down from those deserts, it first of all is pretty dry. It doesn't have a lot of moisture in it because it's from the middle of a continent. But also, as that air sinks down from the, the really quite high deserts, as it goes over the mountains and sinks down into the LA basin, what's happening to it? It's compressing, it's warming up, which is why those winds feel so warm. And as we warm up, remember we're moving further and further away from saturation. Our relative humidity feels really low. It's why you feel like you're shriveling up when the Santa Ana winds come through, because we have such low relative humidity. So you have little moisture in the air to begin with, and then as we warm that air up, it gets even, it feels even drier. Okay? Does that make sense? Everyone's looking a bit stunned today. Is it fifth week? Okay. So that is the atmosphere. And I know that the atmosphere is quite a tricky one, so we're going to move on to something that I think is a little bit simpler to grasp. Okay? We are going to move on to the hydrosphere. So we're going to spend the rest of this week talking about fresh water, um, both in the form of streams today, and then we're all going to talk about groundwater on Friday, which doesn't sound exciting, but it's actually really important for California, the fact that we're not using groundwater sustainably. We also have interesting problems related to groundwater around the world and pollution um, that we'll be talking about. And then next week we're going to talk about the cryosphere, the frozen part of the hydrosphere, and then we're going to talk about the oceans, okay, which is lots of fun. So, here's our hydrologic cycle. And it's a cycle because there's a fixed amount of water, 
And it circulates between a number of the different components of the Earth system. It circulates between the atmosphere, the oceans, the cryosphere, which is the frozen part of Earth's surface, but also the biosphere as well. There's a lot of water in plants. There's a lot of water in animals like us. Okay? And so we're going to talk today about the processes. So we've talked about the atmosphere. We've talked about evaporation, talked a little bit about precipitation, talked about cloud formation. So what we're going to talk about today is this process of runoff. Okay? And we're also going to talk about groundwater on Friday. So here is Earth's water. And actually, the bit that we're interested in as people, which is the freshwater part, is a tiny proportion of the water on Earth. 97% of Earth's water is actually salty water. It's saline water. And 3%, therefore, is what's left behind to us as fresh water. And then of that fresh water, nearly 70% of it is locked away as ice. So it forms our giant ice sheets on Antarctica, our giant ice sheets on Greenland, some of our mountain glaciers around the world. And that leaves another 30% of that 3% in groundwater, which is why it's so important as a, a resource for our fresh water. And then the rest of it in the atmosphere and plants, in streams and lakes and everything else, is 1% of the original 3% that was fresh water. So the bit that we see is a tiny fraction, tiny, 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 almost insignificant, almost not worth talking about, part of the overall hydrologic cycle. But it's the stuff we see, so we are going to talk about it. OK. So first of all, though, I want you to think a little bit. So this is a bit more challenging than the first question. And I want you to tell me, what do you think might have happened to that proportion of fresh versus saline or salty water okay, during the last ice age? So think about what makes up fresh water, what makes up our saline water. What do you think might have happened to that ratio during the last ice age? Do you think we got more fresh water compared to salty water? Do you think we got less? Or do you think it stayed about the same? A few more seconds. So let's take a look. <laughs> it's a tie. OK, someone who said that it increased. Is anyone going to be brave enough to tell me why they said it might have increased during the last ice age? Yeah. Yeah. So definitely we have this idea that there was more ice at the last ice age. And really it comes down to, it's as simple as that, okay? So today we're melting ice because our temperature is increasing. During the last ice age, our temperature was cooler as a planet. And so we had a lot more ice. Less of it melted each year. More of it fell as snow and ice and more of it stayed in the mountains. And we grew enormous ice sheets. We had ice three kilometers thick above New York. I mean, we had a lot of ice on the planet, and we have to get that from somewhere. We can't just spirit it into existence because we want it to be an ice age. It has to come from somewhere, and it came from the oceans. And in fact, so much of it came from the oceans that our sea level 20,000 years ago during the last ice age was 120 meters lower than it was today. So all of the little Channel Islands out there, they were all joined together. You had pygmy mammoths roaming the Channel Islands which is very cool. Um, there were land bridges between the UK and Europe. Um, there was a land bridge between uh, Asia and North America. And we think that's where some of the very first humans that populated North America, they came across that land bridge. OK? So it's a really interesting time. I'm getting sidetracked. But anyway. Wait, I don't get it. <laughs> you don't get it. Were there more proportions or less proportions? So there was more ice. OK? More ice, which means more, more fresh water compared to salt water. So, so the ratio increased. The ratio increased. Yes. Right. OK. 
Good, we've got that clarified. Okay, so the people that said increased got it right, okay? We had more fresh water because we had much more ice, and we took that from the, the oceans, and so the oceans got saltier as well. Okay, so let's talk about streams. Because this is what we want to talk about today, we want to talk about the streams part of the fresh water, what we see. And when I talk about streams, I mean things like rivers as well. Rivers are just slightly larger streams. So our little outline is we're going to talk about the factors that affect stream behavior, because we do see different patterns wherever we go. We also see different landforms that result from streams. So for example, we get our lovely valleys, our V-shaped valleys that form from stream erosion. And then we're going to talk about floods at the end. So something that we don't think in, of in California so much, but actually have affected the area quite um, a lot in the past. So unfortunately, we do need a couple of definitions today, which aren't my favorite thing. But a stream is anything that flows down slope in a clearly defined sort of narrow passageway or channel. Okay? So down here on my left, you can see a stream. Everyone's familiar with this idea. Runoff is, might be a word that isn't as familiar, but you're probably familiar with the concept. It's the, the part of precipitation or snowmelt that doesn't sort of sink and infiltrate into the soil and into the rock. It instead runs across the surface and eventually joins streams. So here's an example here. You can imagine that, and what we see here is that where we get very, very heavy rainfall, or if your sprinklers have been on too long, then it doesn't sink down into the soil anymore. It instead flows across the surface and goes uh, into channels. And usually that's into our sort of drainage systems around here. OK. OK, so let's talk about drainage basins. So drainage basins are basically, if I put a little drop of water anywhere in that area, it would end up flowing into the Mississippi. It's a drainage basin. It basically captures any of the precip precipitation that falls into that area. So my question for you is, why does the Mississippi drain that way? Why doesn't it come over to the Pacific? Why does it drain into the Atlantic? There's mountains in the way. Thank you, yes. OK, so our drainage basins are really split up based on our mountains. So again, we're coming back to the geosphere. So you can see that the Mississippi Basin there is huge in the, the US. Um, and it's sort, of bar it's sort of bordered on all sides by little mountain ranges. And you can see the, the very, very huge Amazon Basin in the, the sort of South American continent. Um, and it's only bordered on the very edge of that continent by the Andes, uh, those volcanic mountain chains that run along the edge of that continent. OK. So our our boundaries. So I want to prove to you that you basically know all this stuff already. You just have to explain this to yourself. So I want you to look at these images, one, two, and three, and tell me what order they sort of would be taken in if you're going from the source, so where the, the stream starts up in the so highland areas, to the sea. Okay? So I want you to put them in order. So does it go two, one, three, three, one, two, etc.? So what do you think? And it's not a trick question. OK, a few more seconds. OK. C. OK? Three, one, two. You're absolutely right. I think that's probably the best ratio I've got for a while. So tell me why. You all know, so why? What could you tell? Sorry? Rocks. Yeah, rocks give you one indication. What else gives you an indication that you might be? Yep, so you could maybe look at how steep it is. What else do you notice perhaps about the these <laughs> images? Yeah. The algae on the rocks? It's algae on the rocks, absolutely. So it sort of suggests it's a nice wet 
place, perhaps. How about just the amount of water? That gives us a pretty good indication, right? Okay. Um, and how do we end up with that amount of water? It's because all of those little streams are joining together. Okay. And so there's certain things that you instinctively know, and we're going to list those things because it's basically those reasons that you just gave me. Okay. So our first is the average width and depth of the channel. You're familiar with the idea that when we're further up in the mountains, then our channels tend to be narrower and they tend to be a little bit uh, sort of shallower. Okay. So our, here's our average width and depth of our channel, and that's the first thing that really controls its behavior as water moving downstream. The second thing is the channel gradient, and what I mean by that is basically how steep it is. So just like we had a pressure gradient, a change between high and low pressure, here we have a channel gradient, a change in height over a distance. And so obviously in the mountains, we, we are steeper. We see a, a larger gradient than we do down close to the coast. Okay? Then we have average velocity. Okay? So speed in a certain direction. This is velocity. And so I have a question for you. So where will the stream velocity be fastest? Will it be A, B, or C? <laughs> Couple more seconds. Okay, we're well, going to take a look. You'll see if I... So everyone said A. I have a follow-up question. If you were kayaking down this river and you were racing some people, where would you go if you wanted to go fastest? Would you go close to the edges or in the middle? So if you wanted to go as fast as possible, where would you go? Okay, let's take a look and see. So you go in the middle, absolutely, and you would be right. Why would you go in the middle? Why is it fastest in the middle of the stream? Less yeah, there's less obstruction, and what does that obstruction cause? So less friction, okay? This friction will act to slow down the river. Wherever that river is sort of bumping into rocks and everything else, it's creating white water. It looks like it's going fast. What's actually happening is it's being turbulent. It may be moving fast, but it's not going actually in one direction. It's going in all directions, OK? And so this is one of those things that we think we know, and actually it isn't quite true. If we measure it, OK, then you actually get much faster streams at C, OK? So C is the right answer in this case. And it's something that seems a bit odd to us because you think where it's steepest, it must be fastest. But because of the characteristics of the streams in those varieties, you get lots of water moving around and a lot of it's going in ways other than straight down. Okay? So our velocity actually increases ever so slightly as we go towards the coast. And you can see that that's also to do with how much water there is. If you have a small amount of water, then it's going to be in contact with a larger area. Okay? Whereas if you have a lot of water down at the coast, you can see that a lot more of that water isn't going to feel any friction with the sides, with the beds of the river. Okay? So it's one of those funny ones that we actually have the wrong way around in our heads. The other thing that affects our stream behavior is discharge, basically the amount of water coming down our river or our stream. And so it's just basically the cross-section, the width times the depth, and then how, how quickly it's moving through. Okay. And then lastly, oh, this is just a summary of those, which is as we go from A to C, our width increases, our depth increases, our discharge increases, and our velocity also increases. Okay. 
So all of these things increase as we go down. So the last thing I want to talk about is sediment, okay? Because as we look at uh, rivers, then they're not beautiful uh, crystal blue waters heading down to the sea. Often they look really muddy, okay? And that's not necessarily pollution. A lot of that is meant to be there because rivers are really good ways of transporting sediment um, to the ocean. So we have three different ways that rivers can move material around and carry material. First of all, we have what we call the bed load. And that's literally the stuff you see at the stream bed. And every now and again, it might get nudged along a bit. And then in another year or so, it might get nudged along a bit again. Or in a flood, it might be carried a little bit further down. And so it moves pretty slowly. And that tends to be really large particles. Then we have what we call the suspended load. And that's what we see when we talk about things that are sort of look really muddy in the water and, and sort of nasty and, and yellow and brown. It's basically because we have lots of fine particles suspended in that water, just like we have aerosols suspended in our atmosphere. We have little particles of silt, little particles of mud being carried along by the water. And the amount and the size of those things being moved by the stream will depend on how fast it's going. Okay? And I'm not going to insult you by asking the next question, because I was going to ask you what you thought the relationship was. But I think everyone realizes that the faster you're going, the bigger the things you're going to be able to take with you. Okay? So if you sit in a rubber tube in a puddle, you're not going to go anywhere. If you sit in a rubber tube um, and you're sort of in a large river, then you're going to go somewhere. And lastly, we have something called the dissolved load. So dissolved material in water. So what other process, we're going back a couple of weeks now, but what other process have we talked about which involved dissolving material? Weathering. weathering, chemical weathering. So this is how that material that we chemically weather moves. So our chemically weathered material ends up in water, which ends up in streams, and then it goes down to the oceans. What is it about the oceans that makes them distinct from our streams? The salt, the salinity. And so that's what's actually creating our salinity. It's that dissolved material. Our chemical weathering is producing this dissolved material, which is going into our oceans and creating the salinity that we, we can taste and we can measure. Okay, So streams are very important for moving material around and also eroding things. It's not necessarily the, the force of the water smashing into rocks that breaks them apart along rivers. It's the particles that those water, that water carries that, that breaks things. OK. And I'm not going to insult your intelligence with that. But I do want to talk about two different types of channel. Because often we see things like braided streams, and other times we see something more like a meandering stream, where we have more of, sort of one channel uh, meandering across the landscape. And these are to do with a variety of different factors, um, but mainly it's these braided streams have so much sediment contained in them that they're constantly depositing material, and then they constantly have to shift their path. Okay? So braided streams have quite variable flow rates. Sometimes they carry lots of material, and sometimes they dump it. Can you be quiet at the back, please? I can hear you from the front, so you must be really annoying everyone around you. OK. And these are more typical of glacial meltwater. Meandering streams are more what we see as we get closer to the, the coastline. Okay? Um, and we see these nice bends in the river. And these are created by changes in velocity of the stream. Okay? So if you think about what happens if you go down one of those, sort of, uh, those rides, I can't remember what they're called right now, um, or you can imagine like sleds or luges or things like that, then as you hit the edge, you go up a little bit because you're actually fastest going around that outer edge. And so we get the most erosion as that water hits and goes around the outer edge. And then it goes in a straight line again, and then it hits the other outer edge. And so our meanders are constantly eroding away and moving across the landscape. Okay? And so you can see that every now and again, that means that we'll cut off one of these meanders. There'll be enough erosion that we end up sort of cutting one of these off, and we create little lakes. And we also create this much wider area that, um, called the floodplain. 
So that river is gradually cutting down into the, the Earth's surface. But at the same time, you can see that it's not just around the, the channel that's doing that. It's actually over a much larger area. Okay? And we like building on this nice flat area. Flat areas are good to build on. We also like farming on this nice flat area because it has lots of nice silt and sediment that we can grow things well in. But there's a reason that it, this is here. And the reason that this forms is that every now and again, there's more water coming down our channel than that channel can hold. And so that water moves out of the channel and spreads out. And as it moves out of the channel and spreads out, it feels more friction, it's going to slow down, and it's going to deposit lots of the silt and the mud and everything else that it was carrying in the channel. It's going to deposit it on what we call our floodplain. Okay? So when you're buying a house, this is something you want to be aware of, because you don't want to end up with a house right next to the river on the floodplain. Um, and here you can see just some examples. I love this one in the lower left-hand corner because you can really see how dynamic these channels are, that they really shift position a lot across the landscape. Okay? So let's talk about a couple of, sort of the features that we see as a result of our stream deposition. So in this image here, you can see our tiny stream down here in this very lower edge, but it's carved this really quite dramatic landscape around it. And you can imagine that as that stream keeps cutting down, it's going to abandon previous floodplains, so previous areas that it would flood, as it keeps eroding down into the landscape, it's going to abandon some of them and create new ones. And so we have two generations of, flood, of floodplain here. We have our channel and our floodplain today stretching across here, but then you can see that in the past we had a much wider floodplain further up, perhaps because during the last ice age there might have been more water coming down this river. Okay? So these are our abandoned terraces, our stream terraces. So these floodplains that get abandoned as the stream erodes down. This is something that we see a lot in the deserts. So if you go driving around um, through Mojave and everywhere else, you can see things like this. So sort of sloping areas of sediment coming out from sort of channels in the mountains, and they create this sort of conical type shape. And it's basically, again, where we have water in the channel flowing down the mountain, and then it hits this nice flat area, and it spreads out. And as it spreads out, it loses speed. And as it loses speed, it can't carry as heavy particles anymore. And so it drops those particles in this nice sort of spread out pattern. And this is something that's called an alluvial fan. And you see those a lot. So have a look next time you're driving around and see if you can spot them. Because they're absolutely everywhere. And then lastly, and more familiar for most of us, we have deltas. So does anyone know which the delta is on the right? The Nile. Does anyone know what the delta is on the left, slightly closer to home? Mississippi. Yeah, absolutely. And these are basically the same idea as our alluvial fans. We have water coming down our stream. And instead of losing energy because they hit the valley floor, they're losing energy because they hit the sea. So they're not flowing as fast anymore. And so they end up depositing all their sediment. And in particular, you can see that this sort of plume of mud and silt coming out of the Mississippi River there. And you can see that it's sort of spreading out. And as it spreads out, it slows down and then it'll get deposited down. And so Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta is a really very dynamic place. It's shifted position constantly in the last sort of tens of thousands of years and longer. OK. So I have five minutes to talk about floods, which is good, because I wanted to spend some time on this. So this is what happens when the Mississippi River flooded in 2011. And this you could see from space. So the Mississippi River is a huge, huge river to begin with. And it has a massive floodplain, which we have found it very helpful to build on and farm. And so you can see that when we had this flooding, all of these lovely towns that were built on the river to make use of easy transport and everything else were in real trouble. Okay? Um, and so we see flooding of the floodplain. So my one in a hundred year flood. Okay? So a hundred year flood means that in any year, what sort of chance will there be that that flood occurs? Okay? 
So what do you understand when I mean, when I say a hundred year flood? Few more seconds. Okay. Yeah, everyone's doing very well today. Okay. So, one out of a hundred. Does that mean it can't happen again next year? No, not necessarily. It's a one in a hundred chance that it might happen this year. It's a one in a hundred chance it could happen next year. So. It's, it's one of those things that just because it happens once doesn't necessarily mean it can't. It's, m it's much less likely, and so we have what we call recurrence intervals. So this is how we construct these likelihoods. And this is, again, important. If you're going to be buying a house anywhere, you probably want to look at where the one in the 50-year flood, flood would be. Okay? So you can see that we basically plot the amount of discharge coming down the river in different years, and you can see that sometimes when it gets really high, we only ever see that amount of discharge coming down the river every 50 years or so. And so our recurrence interval of that sort of flooding is 50 years. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it only happens once every 50 years. So the Colorado floods that we saw earlier this year, they were an example of a one in a hundred year flood. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's not gonna happen for another hundred years, it's just that's what happens on average. But we know that floods are coming. That's the good thing. What have we done to the Santa Ana River that helps us um, re reduce the risk of flooding? Has anyone been to the Santa Ana River? No? Yes. <laughs> you might have cycled along it. It's completely concreted. Okay, we've, yeah, we've channelized it all the way along. Okay, so we can't often see the amount of flooding that we would see. And we know that floods are coming. We can mitigate it. We can engineer it. And I want you to tell you briefly about California superstorms and flooding. So this is something that happens about once every 150 to 400 years. It last happened in about 1861 to 62. And it rained for about 45 days solid from December to January. Got about 38 inches of rain in, La in uh, San Francisco in that one month, which is just insane. And you can say that this was downtown Sacramento. It was in about 10 feet of water. And this is something that we need to be concerned about. We need to plan. And this is from a government report. This isn't me making it up. This is from a government report showing the areas that would be flooded by a similar storm today. So this last storm created a 200-mile inland lake in the Central Valley. Okay. So this is something that we need to be aware of. It, it will happen in our future. It may not happen soon. It may be another 250 years. But it's something that will potentially affect you. OK. So read that over, and uh, we'll continue on Friday. Happy Halloween.